The archetypal character of the retributive anti-hero, one who makes his own rules and follows his own conscience, is a familiar figure in mass culture, appearing in film, television, video games, and comics. This character represents the frustrations of millions of people who feel powerless and who fantasize about striking back against their enemies, be they real or imagined. Welcome to Superhero Rundown! I'm Jess, and today we're going to delve into the territory that's going to make me either a great video essayist and put me on the map, or get me a ton of comments about how I'm the worst and not all men and put me on the map. Yep, we're talking about men, revenge, and Frederick Nietzsche. By the way, that above quote said by my friend Dominic Noble, it's true in a way. The Punisher, Jonah Hex, and Max Payne all have movies where they play an anti-hero consumed by revenge with each being in comics, movies, television, and video games. But what are we really examining here? It's definitely these films, and it's definitely about revenge, but there's more to revenge and retributive justice than these films are actually letting on. So to start, let's talk about what all five films have in common. They are told from the standpoint of an anti-hero. Their family was killed in some gruesome way, and it's now up to them to quash their pain and actually man up and get some good old-fashioned revenge on the guys who totally had something to do with the murder. Which brings us to Frederick Nietzsche and his ideas of pain, pleasure, and revenge. Nietzsche was born in 1844 in Germany, and he worked as a philosopher, cultural critic, and scholar, among other professions, who died in 1900. But what interests us is his body of work, which ranged from art, history, religion, culture, science, poetry, fiction, and irony. So you're like, big deal, Jess. Nietzsche's like a dead guy from the 19th century and it's hard to spell his name, so what's he got to do with the Punisher and Max Payne and Jonah Hex? Well, nihilism is interesting and all, but I'm more interested in his theories of pain and revenge and how emotion factors into it. Specifically because not a lot of society really talks about men's emotions. They usually dismiss them as being soft or call them derogatory names like sissies, crybabies, or whatever else people can come up with. See, Nietzsche wasn't just all about, hey, God is dead, and nihilism. He did contribute more to society than most people think. Now, before you think this is a love letter to Nietzsche, I will disclose that I have read a lot of his work, and I do think highly of the guy. Side note, Nietzsche's opinions were explicitly opposed to nationalism and anti-Semitism, but his sister Elizabeth decided to fuck all that up by making his writings fit more into the fascism and Nazism thing, and God damn it, there's that word again. I'm so fucking tired. But for our purposes today, we'll be looking at his philosophy on pain starting with this. Nietzsche believed that pain and pleasure are antitheses, so naturally revenge is the intersection, right? Well, it's a bit more than that. He thinks that pain is the work of intelligence, the function of which is to provide us with a stimulus that will guide us through processes such as reaction to the future avoidance of certain states and conditions. In other words, it's vital for us to embrace pain, which is what these three anti-heroes do. In that, they decide to take revenge for the wrongs committed unto them. Did I say unto? Nietzsche, get out of my brain. And beyond good and evil, Nietzsche stresses that moral systems arise in response to the problem of suffering, the problem of pain. So we know that Punisher Jonah Hex and Max Payne have a moral system by this metric because they are experiencing the suffering of losing a loved one and the pain of being the only survivor. Notoriously, and no doubt still offensively, Nietzsche stressed the necessity to be willing to confront the need and indeed the desire to inflict pain upon others. But for Nietzsche, the will to punish something which must be acknowledged, in effect, which must be understood and overcome. So all these guys are failing Nietzsche's class on overcoming the will to punish something. So good going, fellas. You're doing your families proud. Nietzsche sees the urge for revenge to be at the heart of the institution of punishment, and this in turn sets the movies in motion. It's more of an urge for revenge that drives these guys, which explains why they don't want to involve law enforcement. Like at all. Okay, so what does this actually mean in practice? Well, let's start with our good friend the Punisher. In addition to his thirst for revenge, and true to his comic book counterpart, all three versions of the Punisher do not sport a colorful outfit. Rather than sporting a colorful outfit, the Punisher was garbed in a black unitard that featured an enormous skull image and a fully stocked ammunition belt. The white boots and white gloves he wore neatly symbolized the binary, black and white nature of his thinking, and added a somewhat implausible note of visual contrast. But in the movies, he's in all black. 
The movies seem to imply that it's not just good versus evil for the Punisher. It's more about retribution. At the end of all three films, he promises to keep punishing the guilty. For fuck's sake, he hires a Russian guy's army to blow away all the bad guys in Warzone. That's not black and white thinking. That's all black thinking, as in revenge forever thinking. Ken Worcester hits the nail on the head in his article, The Punisher and the Politics of Retributive Justice, when he says, Frank Castle was always a moralist with an itchy trigger finger, but he needed a catalyst to transform himself into a domestic warrior. The murder of his family provided the catalyst. Once his campaign of vengeance began, he jettisoned his civilian identity and assumed the role of the Punisher on a full-time basis. He does not require a mask or a secret identity because he has no family to protect. So ask yourself, are the people who are going out there and gunning people down in churches, music festivals, schools, mosques, and nightclubs, among other places, really acting in the Punisher's morality? Because they aren't. They are transphobic, hateful racists who have an idol in the President of the United States. As of this recording. They think they're doing the country a favor. But they aren't. They aren't the Punisher. And if Frank Castle were really an anti-hero in our world running around and killing the guilty, the people responsible for this kind of violence would be on his list too. With that said, some people can romanticize what Frank Castle represents. Worcester continues saying, but the Punisher has never been marketed as a paragon of virtue, and some of his own writers have arguably treated the character as a sociopath. His task is to model the logic, sources, and consequences of vengeance. I still say the best and most hilarious thing in Punisher 2004 is when he threatens Mick with a blowtorch and hits Mick with a frozen popsicle. It's the only relief in this mess of a love letter to guns. And I know what you're thinking. Jess, why did you bring up mass shootings if you're only gonna point out the hilarious things about the Punisher movies? Because dismissing the character sidesteps the issue of what the Punisher brings to the conversation. What makes the character worth thinking about are not the opinions he expresses or the putative selectivity of his targets, but the larger argument he embodies. His entire career makes the case for the idea that anger is righteous, that it illuminates, clarifies, and cleanses, and that it belongs in the public realm. Anger can be righteous. But gunning down innocent people in a Walmart or a church or a school or a music festival or your own home is not. Worcester continues, most liberal and conservatives would accept Thomas Hobbes' notion that civil society is where the strong emotions of the state of nature give way to reason and legitimate order. Modern political thought is built on the assumption that passions, especially violent passions, are potentially destabilizing, and that the job of the law, social norms, and public institutions is to establish and protect communities where differences can be settled without recourse to blood feuds, internal war, or other forms of unsanctioned, politically illegitimate violence. So in essence, modern society thinks that the Punisher would be bad in terms of settling differences and killing people. But the Punisher is right in a way. He sees the world as a place where civil society and the law are used by bullies to inflict pain on others. In reality, the world is a place where civil society and the law are used by bullies to inflict pain on others. Wait, that can't be right. Wow, the world sucks. See, the Punisher doesn't believe in compromise or negotiation or deal making. Politics is about making compromises, but I think we should take a page out of Punisher's book and not negotiate with the rich and powerful. No one seems to care about climate change or the fact that my generation is suffering and being laid off, or that we apparently need to be riddled with so much student loan debt just to get a decent job. And even then, it's not always guaranteed you're gonna be okay because of rent prices skyrocketing. My point is, while we can believe that anger is righteous, gunning people down for revenge is not exactly the way to go about it. But why is The Punisher so important? Well, the way these films are shot, it's actually more like gun pornography. And it's gross. It's not exactly normal. But then again, John Elster writes in Norms of Revenge that rational individuals follow the principles of letting bygones be bygones, cutting their losses and ignoring sunk costs. Whereas the Avenger typically refuses to 
forget an affront or harm to which he has been exposed, like the Punisher. Let's talk about punishment, or more specifically, war as punishment. According to David Lubin, the punishment theory assumes, one, that states or other armed groups can commit punishable wrongdoing attributable to them as corporate bodies, much in the way under some countries' domestic law, corporations as legal persons can commit crimes. Two, that in the absence of a world government, individual states can assume the role of punisher. And three, that military strikes on a wrongdoer or her property will in some cases be the only feasible form international punishment can take. If we apply this to Frank Castle, he is an armed individual who has assumed the role of punisher as local law enforcement has done nothing in the revenge department for his family. So obviously he has to call in an entire Russian mob so he can blow up the bad guys or basically anything else Michael Bay would explode to get his point across. One last thing before we move on. Payback can mean proportional retribution, meeting out the measure that they meted out to us, or sheer revenge, meeting out more than the measure that they meted out to us. And the distinction between retribution and revenge will play an important part in my subsequent argument. But for the moment, it is more important to focus on what retribution and revenge have in common. Their root is not concern about future safety, but indignation over past wronged. That describes Punisher to a T, but what about Max Payne or Jonah Hex? I, for one, loved the Jonah Hex movie. Aside from basically everyone being in it, it was a wild ride. John Malkovich is our villain, Michael Fassbender and Wes Bentley help him out, Will Arnett and Megan Fox help out Josh Brolin as our titular character, and Jeffrey Dean Morgan shows up at some point, so that's cool. The movie is an absolute blast. What's this got to do with what we're talking about? Well, Jonah can raise the dead to ask questions, and he's after John Malkovich because Malkovich killed his family. It's a revenge story of sorts, but Jonah, after it's all said and done, kind of lets it lie in a way. One of the best things to come out of the Jonah Hex movie is the fight with Malkovich and the juxtaposition of Jonah Hex almost dying. It's a beautiful piece of cinema, and when it's all said and done, Jonah tells the audience, They say a man with vengeance in his heart is supposed to dig two graves. Didn't you know Jonah Hex is a badass? Now, the difference between Jonah Hex and the Punisher is that Jonah seems a bit more level-headed, even if he also gets his revenge. Jonah Hex is set during the Civil War, so a lot of things are already happening to the United States as is. The backdrop of the Civil War seems to be a way for us to excuse Hex's behavior because a lot of war crimes tend to happen in war. Avengers, however, have a problem with proportionality. Vengeful rage has no logical stopping point internal to itself. It never relents until the passion has discharged itself on its target. The Avenger may undergo a change of heart or for some other reason decide to show mercy, but the decision for mercy remains as ungoverned by standards of impartial judgment and proportionality as the vengefulness itself. We excuse Hex because of a war going on, but we don't excuse the Punisher because he makes the war himself. John Elster kind of fetishizes revenge in his article Norms of Revenge by saying, Revenge is an overpowering and consuming fire. It flares up and burns away every other thought and emotion. It alone remains, over and above everything else. Vengeance was the glow in our eyes, the flame in our cheeks, the pounding in our temples, the word that had turned to stone on our throats on our hearing that our blood had been shed. Vengeance is not hatred, but the wildest, sweetest kind of drunkenness, both for those who must wreak vengeance and for those who wish to be avenged. And that brings us to Max Payne. Payne doesn't exactly fall into the category of vengeance and war like Jonah Hex or making his own war like the Punisher. He's more of a middling aspect of revenge. He's trying to figure out who killed his family, and he's actually a pretty good detective, all things considered. Max seems to break down the questions asked by John Elster in Norms of Revenge. Mainly, what constitutes an affront that must be avenged? Who is allowed or required to exact revenge? What means can legitimately be used in taking revenge? How soon is vengeance allowed or required to take place? Whose death shall expiate an affront? What fate is reserved for those who fail to take revenge when the norms require it? My family was murdered. I'm allowed to avenge this. Any means necessary because I'm a cop. When I find the guy, he's dead. 
the guy who did it. Doesn't matter. I fulfilled my quest for vengeance at the end of this movie. What do all these guys have in common? They're the harmed party. And David Lubin underlines the problem with that. The problem with allowing the harmed party to act as the judge and enforcer of retribution is simply that retribution demands proportionality and vengeful rage cannot provide it. Vengefulness distorts judgment in two ways. First, rage provides a poor measure of how much hurt the Avenger has actually experienced. Second, the subjective experience of hurt provides a poor measure of how badly the wrongdoer has acted. This double distortion makes vengefulness inherently unreasonable. The level of punishment should be proportional to the offender's level of objective wrongdoing, not to the avenger's level of rage. Ultimately, the double distortion explains why collapsing the role of plaintiff and judge is so dangerous. The aggrieved plaintiff can hardly see around her own rage to judge impartially. Yeah, in the case of all three of these guys, only a few people died to send them on a crusade of retributive murders, and the collateral they create is not proportional to the initial crime of murdering their wives and children. So why are revenge fantasies an issue for today's world? Well, for one thing, they can teach people the normalization of violence. It might be why we are so desensitized to school shootings nowadays, or why we don't really cover mass shootings unless it's a highly publicized event on Twitter or has a high enough body count for the rage to ensue against politicians and the NRA again. John G. Cavelti says that the gun is our prime symbol of moral violence in his article, The Myths of Violence in American Popular Culture. It does explain why all three heroes use a gun in their movies. Cavelti goes on to say that, observing the pervasiveness of the story pattern of morally necessary violence does not carry us very far into an understanding of the imaginative significance of all these shootouts and heroic killings. Indeed, the treatment of heroic violence as morally just Justified has been an almost inevitable accompaniment of stories of heroic adventures since the epic of Homer. To have a truly splendid hero, we must have a man who faces the ultimate challenge of life and death and emerges triumphant. And if the hero becomes involved in violence, his action must be justified in some sense, if only because it is performed by a hero. Yeah, the problem isn't that the Punisher or Jonah Hex or Max Payne use guns. It's that the gun is portrayed as being a morally necessary weapon for them to exact their vengeance on the people who wronged them. So where does this leave us? Cultural sustainability is about maintaining the cultural beliefs, cultural practices, heritage conservation, and culture as its own entity. How can we maintain this belief system when it's killing innocent people? Guns aren't the problem. Access to guns is. We don't seem to understand as a body politic that guns and violent video games aren't the problem. Violent people are. Also considering how American culture fetishizes guns in characters like Max Payne, Jonah Hex, and The Punisher, that could be part of the problem too. It's time to stop giving voice to people who want to harm the innocent. For the hard-boiled hero, violence is a test of honor and integrity, a means of proving an individual code of morality which transcends both the law and the conventional morality of society. He is prepared to risk his life in man-to-man -man confrontations with the criminal, but it is also significant that he uses his violent abilities with extreme moral restraint. By that definition, the only guy who fits the bill as a hard-boiled hero is Jonah Hex. In the myth of the vigilante, however, the hero is generally an isolated individual who must cope with the weakness and corruption of the community, as well as the violence of criminals and outlaws. Moreover, the vigilante myth appears to be more characteristic of 20th than of 19th century stories of violence. If the vigilante is such a staple of the 20th century, then why do we keep making superhero movies? Because they are part of our culture. From the pulps and serials of the 1940s to the action-packed blockbusters of today, superheroes don't seem to be going anywhere. And that's okay, as long as we remember that sometimes the lesson isn't to do violence to others, but to think about the issues of vengeance and revenge.
bitch, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Reminds me of Darwin's. 